from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Epiphany. It is the Greek word that means revelation or radiant appearing. God's Son was finally born into the world, but who was He? Why had He come? For whom had He come? I mean, even Joseph and Mary, they only know little bits and pieces. Simeon, Anna, little bits and pieces. The Magi even, which we observed yesterday, little bits and pieces. But God will make it clear, little by little, throughout Jesus' life, and today with Christ's baptism, it is undeniable who He is. Let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, growing up in a Baptist church, baptism did not mean that much to me. Even though I was baptized at an early age, I was in church all of the time. I was a regular reader of my Bible even uh, before I got into my teenage years. Baptism, as I was taught, was just symbolic. It's nothing more. Eventually, I graduated from a Southern Baptist seminary and later completed all of my doctoral work at a Reformed seminary, but still, in all of that formal education and training, baptism did not mean that much to any of us. I mean, why would it? However, when I started spending time with Lutheran pastors, and you, you got to be real careful there. <laughs> These are like the frat boys of Christianity. Here I was, a Southern Baptist guy hanging out with these Lutheran pastors. My goodness. But boy, they spoke about baptism all the time. Every one of their sermons mentioned baptism. Even normal conversation, they would talk about baptism. Whereas in the Southern Baptist circles, when somebody would, you know, get off the, you know, they would walk away from the Lord, sayings like this, they would walk away from the Lord, you would hear a Southern Baptist say, they need to rededicate their life. They need to rededicate their life to Jesus. Lutherans don't talk like that. They would say, they need to return to the waters of their baptism. I remember the first time I heard a pastor say that in regard to a person that had apostatized. apostatized they, they need to return to the waters of their baptism. I thought, what? What in the world? It was a real head-scratcher to me. And I thought about all the Lutherans who talk this way. Why do they do this? It's because they knew that everything in the Christian life begins and it ends with baptism. Speaking of beginning, how exactly did the world begin? Well, that's easy, Pastor. All the matter of the universe was compressed into one tiny point until it finally exploded, creating our universe in this rock that we call Earth. And after being pelted with meteorites along with radioactive decay and further compression due to gravity, of course, the earth was cooled, and it was covered with this primordial ooze, kind of like split pea soup. And then lightning, it struck the soup, and it formed amoebas, and after a bajillion years, there was life, which eventually crawled up on the shore, and it continued to evolve. Please. You know, most of us spent a small fortune learning that garbage. Some of us are still paying for it. And every time we watch a nature show on PBS, every time we visit a museum, we're, we're exposed to that exact same drivel. It's nothing more than the devil's catechism. For the Bible is clear. Originally there was chaos, there was darkness, and there was water. And the presence of the Holy Spirit. And seemingly out of nowhere, there was this God who speaks. And when He did, a new creation 
came forth. A new birth. It's two totally different worldviews, isn't it? Both of which require faith because none of us were at creation. I wasn't there. Your biology teacher wasn't there either. But God was there and He done lie. So who are you going to believe? Truth be told, though, the opening verses of the Bible were not written to argue with the evolutionists. Though they can be used for that. Ultimately, though, those verses were written to point us to holy baptism. In that God does something miraculous when there is water, when there is His Spirit, and when His Word. And when all three of those combine, when those three converge, God brings about something new. A new birth, a new creation. Now this account is read within the opening verses of the Bible and everyone with a New Year's resolution to read the Bible reads it. That is, before they give up when they reach the book of, you know, say Numbers or something. Sure, baptism is clarified later in the Bible, but you're supposed to read it at the very beginning. And not forget where you saw it first. <clears throat> to not forget the pattern that God lays down at the beginning for He does not change. To be sure, there are other instances in the Old Testament which point directly to holy baptism. You remember, of course, Noah and his family being saved from judgment. This is why the baptismal font has eight sides to not only recall the eighth day, but also to recall the family of Noah saved from judgment. You remember Naaman, him washing away his leprosy in the waters of the Jordan. Remember the Israelites crossing the Red Sea on their way to the Promised Land? It's all there. However, and all of those pictures from the very beginning, from the very beginning, all the way to those pictures, it's like the Lord just kind of drops these breadcrumbs. And then, of course, my goodness, when you get to Jesus being baptized, that's when it becomes very, very clear. When Jesus stepped down into the riverside, John tried to prevent him. John said, I should be, being, I should be baptized by you. You're coming to me. It seemed upside down to John because John's baptism is a sinner's baptism. Thus, the sinner, i.e. John, should be being baptized by the sinless one. John is right, at least in his way of thinking. But Jesus explains, he goes on further, and they're the first words that our Lord is said to have spoken in Matthew's account. He says, Let it be so now, John, for it is fitting, meaning it's proper, it's normal for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now look, I wasn't there to witness this, and again, neither was your biology teacher. The heart can only grasp it in faith. But somehow... When the spotless holy Christ steps into those waters of the dirty Jordan River, remember what Naaman said? It's like, why do I have to wash myself in a dirty Jordan River? The rivers back home are much cleaner. And you think about that. The man has leprosy, has open sores. How many of you want to jump into a dirty river when you got open sores? Makes sense with Naaman. I'd, rather, I'd much rather go back home where it's cleaner. But here when Jesus, when he steps into those dirty Jordan River waters and he bows his sinless head like all of the other penitents seeking to be washed in this bath of forgiveness, all righteousness at that point is fulfilled. And there Jesus absorbs all of the sin for the water does not sanctify Jesus, but Jesus sanctifies the water. For as he absorbs the sin of which he will carry to the cross, the water that flows off his head and his back flows into all of the fonts of Christendom as pure, holy, life-giving waters that are rich in grace and mercy. So, beloved, Jesus does not step into the water because he's a sinner. He steps into the water because you're a sinner. 
Jesus does not need baptism. But you do. So connect the dots. In Advent, we observe God coming to you. At Christmas, we observe Jesus joining you in his flesh and his blood. And the incarnation was like a, a cosmic bomb with Bethlehem being ground zero. And when the Word of God made flesh hits our timeline, it ripples forward and it ripples back. And now here, Jesus moves even closer. He joins you in the water. Symbolism? <laughs> what a load of hooey that is! For wherever Jesus touches, things cannot be the same again. You can ask the lepers. You can ask the blind man. You can ask Lazarus. Thus, in our baptism, we too escape judgment and we float on the ark with Noah. We too have the leprosy of our sin washed away just like Naaman of old. And we too, like the Israelites, we cross the Red Sea unscathed as we make our way to the Promised Land. And if all of that wasn't enough, what comes forth from whatever font of water you were baptized in, that font where the Holy Spirit was combined with the Word, at that place, no matter how old you were, your sins were washed away and you became just like creation, but a new creation. Born again. Or as it reads in John 6, born from above. And look, here from St. Paul. Do you not know? I, it's, like, it's like he's a teacher going, hey, don't you know this? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in, listen, newness of life. New life, new creation, word, water, and what else? The Holy Spirit, all combined, new life. Gang, it's a new creation. I get it now why the Lutherans are talking about it all the time. I get it now. I didn't see it before. It's a new creation hinted at at the first few verses of the Bible, all because Jesus stepped into those waters, turning John's baptism into what we call holy baptism. Now to those of us, namely all of us, who have been born in Adam's sin and held captive to it, this is good news. To those of us, namely all of us, steeped in sin and condemned by God's law, this is very good news. To those of us, namely all of us, whose righteousness can't by any means fulfill all righteousness, what incredibly good news this is. That Jesus, though sinless, was baptized as a sinner so that you, though sinful, might be baptized into His righteousness and holiness, baptized into His very death, baptized into His resurrection. This is such a happy exchange. This is such a blessed exchange. The sinless one for the sinner. And beloved, that reality changes everything. As I say, gratefully now, I get to join in that chorus of Lutheran pastors who remind their congregations again and again and again in their sermons and in their normal everyday talk that you are baptized. I get to join them in reminding all these little sheep that your sins were washed away in those blessed waters and you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in you, God is well pleased. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. We stand together. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue with the offertory.